Hello, folks. Welcome back. Welcome back. It's me, Shingi Mavima. I know it's been a long time. Where does the time go? Am I right? But hopefully this is the first of a couple of videos that I will do uh, over the next uh, month or so. So, so, but thank you for, 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 for coming back and thank you uh, to our new subscribers, new viewers, you know, and I hope you enjoy this. So today we are talking about a topic that I just couldn't believe when I went through my, uh, the, the past videos that I have not spoken about before, at least not in any length or in, in a dedicated video. And I'm talking about the ancient empires of Western Africa. Now, when we talk about ancient empires of Western Africa, it's a little bit different from, you know, when you talk about ancient Egypt, because that documentation goes back, you know, 6,000 years, right? Or 5,000 years uh, back to the old kingdom. Whereas when you're talking about ancient Africa, I mean, ancient West Africa, the dates become relatively more modern right you know we're studying really in earnest with our conversation we're starting with the with the with the with the with the third century for example third century in the common era this is not to say that these communities were not vibrant or you know before then but i think that the moment where there is uh decent evidence that we can we can talk about at least when the empires rise to to a noteworthy um level we start with the, the third century going forward. Uh, so we are focusing today on three particular empires. They were not the only empires that existed and we'll quick start out some of the other ones, but we'll start off by talking about ancient Ghana, then we'll go to ancient Mali, then we'll talk about the Songhai Empire. So, and if you're new here, please make sure to like, subscribe, share this video. Uh, if you wanna wait until the end to make sure that you enjoy it before you do, uh, you know, the better. So, but without further ado, uh, you guys have waited long enough. Let me uh, pull up my PowerPoint here and we will, uh, we will get going. And just like that, we are cooking with gas and I'll see you guys at the end. So the first thing we want to acknowledge here, right, is, is what I've already acknowledged that these communities they don't emerge just out of the blue at this time. There's long precedence to 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 their presence here, um, indeed. And in fact, that that very territory we are talking about has uh, has been interacting with groups such as the the Carthaginians, the old school Phoenicians for 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 a long time. Let's let's get right into it so we can we can see what we're talking about. I want to start this conversation by shouting out a trade that goes back a long, long time to the very beginning of the common, you know, going back into the before the common era, right? Like I just mentioned right now, the Phoenicians, for example, who initially came from Lebanon, then settled among the Berbers of North Africa in that Libya, Morocco area. No, actually, the Phoenicians settled right in where Tunisia is now because they 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 had several outposts along that coast but the Phoenicians were settled among the Berbers and the Berbers who were there as they as they mixed up and they intermarried became the Carthaginians right or you know still called the Phoenicians who ended up fighting in the Punic Wars in 200 uh, before the common era all that I've spoken about in a previous video but the important thing that I want to say is the seafaring uh, Phoenicians who settled among the Berbers, they brought with them um, a lot of uh, iron working while the, 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 the Berbers were still doing a lot of bronze type work. I, the, 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 the importance of this is the Berbers were already trading across the Sahara, even as early as 800 BCE, right? They were already trading prior, and then that trade only got invigorated in particular when the Carthaginians, I mean, the Phoenicians settled among them and they became the Carthaginians. So they're already trading with these people from uh, from West Africa, indeed. Now, traditionally, the beast of burden that had made this possible, you know, but, but this trade had been small scale until then, but the beast of burden had been the pack oxen, right? Pack oxen. Now, pack oxen are no punks, right? They could... Uh, they could carry uh 
about as much as 300 pounds per, per cow. But, you know, but they could only travel maybe like six, seven miles uh, a day and uh, would have to drink maybe every four or five days. They couldn't go longer than that. But they are trading. The trading exists. However, and the things that they would trade, what would they trade? They would get a lot of gold from from West Africa and they would uh, trade in with or grain as well. And they would, since there's plenty of salt in the desert uh, to the north, they would trade their salt with, with the communities in West Africa where uh, the salt wasn't as plentiful. The game changer in this conversation is the camel. Now, in my research, I haven't really been able to establish how the camel sort of just emerges in the 300s in the common era, 4th century common era. I don't know where, where, where you know, because you think that the camel has been around. But in any case, it gets into common usage beginning in the 4th century in the common era, which, by the way, this very period here, the 300s, coincide with the birth of ancient Ghana as an empire. Now, like I said, the people have been there, but as an empire, and we'll talk about that shortly here. So the camel, why does the camel change the game? Well, camels are the quintessential desert animal. Make no mistake about it. So in terms of the amount they can carry, it's about the same as, as, as pack oxen, but they can walk further in a day, right? They can walk 15 to 20 miles a day. Okay, what is that? Is that around... Uh, um, you know, 35 to 45 kilometers a day. It's, it's, it's a long distance to walk a day, especially at this time. Uh, webbed feet allow them to traverse the, the, the not, not webbed feet, but their type of hooves allow them to traverse the desert a little bit better. And they can go for 10 days without drinking water. And that's key in the desert, right? And uh, these were mainly handled by the by by the Berber nomads. In fact, we can talk about the Berber nomads as being the essentially the truck drivers of the era. And the the introduction of the camel really expanded the gold trade, right? Really expanded the gold trade, um, because now because the 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 camels could carry much more gold. And what is what is it what is in it for the for the North Africans? Right. Um, think about once we get into the common era, North Africa is occupied by groups such as a earlier on is 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 the is the, the 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 Greeks and the Romans, then the, the Western Roman Empire, then eventually the Byzantium, then eventually the the Arab populations, right? All within that first thousand years. So a lot of these folks were trying to mint their own gold coins, so they were very much invested in getting in, in this trade. And the, the what place is, is known for for its gold? Well, West Africa, of course, right? Where it's south, you know, um, not southwest Africa, but right at the curve where modern Ghana is and, and territories like that. That's why it was called, called the Gold Coast, the south facing coast of West Africa, to be precise. They also, but they also the 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 North Africans were also getting other things, right? Ivory. Right, Cote d'Ivoire, literally the Ivory Coast. So there's a lot of elephants down there, ostrich feathers and furs from the animals of sub-Saharan Africa, and the Africans, the 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 West Africans were getting a lot of salt, uh, and things like that from the North Africa as well as some other trinkets, right, coming from North Africa, maybe coming from Europe by way of North Africa, indeed. So the trans-Saharan trade really changes by the fourth century in the Common Era which coincides with the birth of ancient Ghana, right? So the kingdom of ancient Ghana is one of the most important and honestly best known West uh, of the Iron Age West African states. So you can see here on the map that it was the heart of the regional trade, right? You can see here on the map where it is. Now, notice right away that modern Ghana is down here. Modern Ghana is down here. So the empire of Ghana is not where modern uh, Ghana is, right? Even though the name of modern Ghana is taken from this place. But this is more in that Mali, Mauritania area. That's where the ancient 
empire of Ghana sits. It's not where modern Ghana is. In fact, the people of ancient Ghana were the Soninke people. You know, so it's, you know, some people might think that's a little weird, but when you think about it, it happens all the time, right? Think about, the. it happens all the time that a country is named after another place. In many places, it's, it's that historical place, which is why the great Zimbabwe, for, for example, gives the name to the modern country of Zimbabwe and so forth. Or even ancient Mali it coincides with where modern Mali is. Uh, even though ancient Mali like sprawled among other countries, as we'll see shortly. But, you know, it happens all the time. Think about Memphis, Tennessee, right? What is Memphis? Memphis was in Egypt. Think about places like New Jersey. What is the Jersey in that, right? Um, and I mean, the US is notorious for that, but we can talk about British Columbia in Canada. We can talk about, uh, you know, Victoria in Australia and all these places that are named after either due to, to colonial or historical or cultural connections, or maybe just seeking inspiration, right? We have lots of places in the U.S., Athens, Rome, uh, Angola, that those names originate from from uh, from other countries or other territories for one reason or another. But in any case, the Soninke people, prior to this, prior to the uh, expansion of the, of the trans-Saharan trade, particularly the gold trade, there were all sort of small groups, you know, family groups, a few hundred people there, some a thousand people there, clans doing their own thing. Then they decided to start to band together for the purposes of leveraging their their, their, their impact or their, 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 their voice within the trans-Saharan gold trade. So what is happening here is, again, the Berber nomads from up here are bringing salt, uh, to trade here, and initially, the the empire of Ghana had enough um, of its own grain to trade. But eventually, as the demand for gold grew, they were working essentially as middlemen, getting the gold from from areas down here, the ivory from from down here, moving it along here, then getting the salt from down here, then also moving it down here. Indeed, and Ghana just became after the 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 Soninke consolidated themselves into a, into an empire. Ghana was just one of the titles of the king, which ended up lending its name to, to the kingdom. And yeah, so let's see what this kingdom looked like, right? Was this just some rinky-dinky kingdom? Well, fortunately for us, we have a few descriptions here. Uh, let's see who wrote them. Uh, this one comes from famed Arab geographer, Al-Bakri. Al-Bakri is one of the authorities, particularly in the 11th century. So he's writing in, in the 10 hundred, in the in around 1000 here. Um, the, the earliest writing mention of Ghana we know came from Arab geographer Al-Fazari, who made a brief passing reference to the territory of Ghana, the land of gold, as he called it. Uh, later on, Al-Bakri had this to say. The king's residence provides a palace and conical huts the whole surrounded by a fence like a wall around the royal town are huts and groves of thorn trees where live the magicians who control their religious rites the, these groves where they keep their idols and bury their kings are protected by the gods who permit no one to enter or find out what goes on in them None of those who belong to this to the imperial religion may wear tailored garments except the king himself and the heir presumptive, his sister's son. The rest of the people wear wrappers of cotton, silk, or brocade according to their means. Most of the men shave their beards and women their heads. The king adorns himself with female ornaments around the neck and arms. On his head, he wears embroidered caps covered with turbans of finest cotton. He gives audience to the people for the redressing of grievances in a hut around which are placed 10 horses cover, covered in golden cloth. Behind him stand 10 slaves carrying shields and swords mounted with gold. On his right are the sons of Vassal kings, their heads plated with gold and wearing costly garments. On the ground around him are seated his ministers, while the governors of the city sit before him. 
On guard at the door are dogs of fine pedigree, wearing collars adorned with gold and silver. The royal audience is announced by the beating of, beating of a drum called Daba, made out of a long piece of hollowed out wood. When the people have gathered, his core religionists draw near upon their knees, sprinkling dust upon their heads as a sign of respect, while the Muslims clap hands as their form of greeting. What a description, right? Shout out to Al Bakri, man. This is a very detailed description. But it tells us several different things. The first one is you can tell how prevalent gold was in this community, right? Even the dogs had colors of gold and silver blinged out. <laughs> Um, the slaves were carrying shields and swords mounted with gold. And we've spoken about what being a slave in this period meant and differentiated it from uh, what we soon grew to knew as chattel slavery. People usually recruited into the military or maybe came from uh, groups that had been defeated in war, but they were eventually integrated into the community by way of the army and so forth. You can also tell Al Bakri is is a very religious man in the way he describes this religion that is foreign to him because he calls what many people might call the priests he calls up the magicians and talks about the charms and uh you know just the cultural separation is is very palpable here uh but there was a description of the capital of you know known as Kumbisale, which was the capital of Ghana. For example, when Al Bakri talks about the king adorns himself with female ornaments around the neck and arms. Well, what does that mean? What why what are these female ornaments? My best guess is in this community, only women wear jewelry like that, right? So for example, imagine if in your experience you only come from a place where women wear earrings. When you see a man wearing earrings, you might say he's wearing female jewelry, right? But actually, in many places, men just wear earrings. So I think that's sort of what's going on here. But he describes this in in, in very fantastic terms. And the other thing too, oh, the last thing I will mention about this is how he talks about how his core religionists, like people of the same religion, do one thing, right? What does it say you do? They they draw near upon their knees, sprinkling dust upon their heads as a sign of respect, while the Muslims clap hands as their form of greeting. So what is he saying? Wow, so there's people who are, there's both Muslims and people who believe, be, believe in the more traditional religion of ancient Ghana at this point, right? Because, and the king or the empire itself is organized in such a way that the, the Muslims don't have to do what the traditionalists, if we want to call them that, do in as form of greeting for the king and, the, and vice versa. But they are there, they coexist in this kingdom, or at least in some capacity, right? Indeed. Um... And, uh, you know, the book I'm using here, Shellington goes on to say, the 11th century capital, Kumbisale, was described as two separate towns situated a little distance from each other. One was the distinctly Islamic town set aside for visiting Arab and Berber merchants. And the other one, less than 10 kilometers away, which is like six miles, was the more traditional one, indeed. So this kingdom of Ghana has a good run, lasts for about 700, you know, 800 years but starts to decline by, by 1,050, 1050 in the common era. Now, at its extent, the kingdom of Ghana had expanded uh, to incorporate territories such as the Berber town of Algadust, right? The Ber Islamic Berber town of Algadust to the north, to, is to the north of, of Ghana. And... Um, But now, because they're now occupying or invading territory where the Berbers are, the this weekend, sort of their trade links, now there's some animosity brewing. And in, in around that time, in the 1050s, um, definitely by 1076, this had happened, the Almoravids, who we haven't spoken about, but it's one of the "Quote unquote Moorish dynasties who were who were present in in the in in that in the eleventh century who had reorganized decide to reclaim the, the now they are a force of nature they go and attack Ghana to reclaim the city of Algadus right and that's one of the reasons why 
the kingdom starts to 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 decline. They're in beef now with Al with uh, Almoravids, who again are a force of nature and uh, actually are responsible for keeping Muslim rule in Spain and Portugal and the Iberian Peninsula around the same time that they are reclaiming Algadus from Ghana. Another thing that also happens is the fragmentation fragmentation of the kingdom when more gold mines are found. What does this mean? Well, it's easier to control the to control the distribution of resources or to control the economy when there's a narrow pipeline through which it channels, which is why only the Fed uh, federal mint can control where money comes from, right? Or at least ideally, you know, you can't just be printing your own money uh, and so forth. Or, you know, the, that's federal, federally regulated or depending on where you're watching from the government, if it's running well, it should be controlling that, right? But now that more gold mines were being found, it wasn't just the the the, the king who was controlling this. A lot of people started to do their own thing and they felt they could do this on their own. So this leads to the fragmentation of the kingdom as more gold mines are found and different people, different groups of people are starting to trade with whoever by themselves. Then also over, over 800 years of rule, when you've been uh, mining especially, and you've had guests coming over and you're building, the environment might get depleted as well. So the deterioration of the environment becomes another reason for the decline of Ghana. Now, let's talk about the empire. Oh, let's, let's go back to Ghana real quick. After it declined, it's worth noting that by... 1100 it's it's never really you know there's debates on this on whether the Almora is actually just cut off trade and reclaimed Alga dust and that led to the to the end of Ghana or if they actually occupied or and and, and overthrew Ghana and and sort of occupy them what we know however is the leaders the Soninke leaders of Ghana by the 1100s were themselves Muslim as well and still allowed to operate in a autonomous capacity, which some people point to as proof that they were not actually invaded or overthrown. But some people also say like, no, because they converted to Islam, the Almoravids let them do their own thing, just not at the level that they used to. But in any case, around that time, the empire of Mali um, begins to grow, right? The empire of Mali begins to grow. What do we know about Mali? Well, as ancient Ghana declined, as ancient Ghana, uh, Ghana declined, one of the groups that had been brought into the kingdom. Oh, by the way, sorry, sorry, sorry. I just need to come back to this because I'd mentioned earlier that Ghana wasn't the only kingdom that was there at the time. It's I want to just give a shout out to the early states of Takur, Ga uh, Kanem, and Gao. These are also other smaller kingdoms that were around this territory. So Ghana wasn't the only Iron Age, early Iron Age African state. There were those other ones as well. But from the remnants of ancient Ghana, right, a group gro broke away, a group that had been incorporated into the kingdom of ancient Ghana, a group broke away known as the Soso. And the Soso were led by a gentleman named Sumanguru. You might see his name spelled as Sumauru in other, in other spaces. How do we know what we know about, about this moment? You know, because we're talking about the around 1200, this is when they split. How do we know how, what we know about this? Well, travelers to, to North Africa right? Arab travelers to North Africa, including Ibn Khaldun, famous scholar Ibn Khaldun, who was a Tunisian Berber intellectual, and Ibn Battuta, who's probably even more famous, who was a writer and intellectual, and he went there much later, he went there in the 1300s. But these are some of the scholars who were writing about this. I believe there's another gentleman who spoke about al Bakri, another gentleman, al Omar, who was born in Syria. He's another scholar who will refer to, who wrote a lot about this. So we know from this, but you know, there's also a solid oral tradition coming out of Mali. Uh, and to this day, if you know uh, West African tradition, there's this idea of griots who are 
essentially musician historians or archivists who are and you're born into it right traditionally you're born into it where your father would have been a griot and you're born and from the day you are you are born you are trained to be this custodian of the history of the nation and so some of these epics are told time and again and one such epic is the epic of sunjata right and the story goes it's a fantastic story if you can get your hands on it you know i mean if you can find somebody to tell you the story even better but now it's been printed here's a comic book version of it it's been printed uh there's a book by Duyate which tells, which just records the narration as told by a griot. Incredible work. Uh, I really recommend it. But it's a story of, 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 of Sumanguru and Sunjata. So Sumanguru, right, who was from the Soso people who had been part of ancient Ghana, but as it disintegrates, they split away and it's established their own separate state by 1200. Now, Sumanguru himself is from the Kante clan. So it's probably one of Ngolo Kante's ancestors. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me because that guy, he'd be raiding the field, doesn't he? That's a little shout out to my soccer fans. Uh, but in any case, and Kante, of course, would originally be from, from this general region, at least his people are. Um, but anyway, after Sumanguru seceded from this, he started to raid both the Soninke people and the related Malinke people from that, you know, he secedes from ancient Ghana and starts raiding other groups as well that it maybe seceded or that we're still like figuring it out. But it's very, very brutal. So the story goes, right? And the Malinke people have had enough and Sunjata, known as the Lion King of Mande, right? The daughter of uh, of Sukulu ends up uh, organizing a Malinke revolt. And this is the story that is told. This is this is the story of the emperor of the of the of the epic Sunjata, warrior king of Mali. That's that's this that's what the story is. And he it talks about how he rises up and how he, his destiny is foretold. Then he organizes and he rises up and organizes a Malinka revolt and kills Sumanguru in this battle. And thus the Empire of Mali is born in 1235, right? And established as a separate state, independent of Ghana. But as you can tell, ancient Ghana would have, th there's a map we'll show later that is the overlay of all these kingdoms. But ancient Ghana would have been about this size, right? Kumbisale with its as the capital. But ancient Mali grows to be so much bigger, it's far more expansive to include places like Gao. It's centered largely in Timbuktu. In fact, while ancient Ghana is said to have occupied modern day maybe like West Mauritania and much of some of Mali. Ancient Mali sprouted across Mali itself, Niger, Senegal, Mauritania, Guinea, and the Gambia. So that's that's huge. That that's a that's a big empire. So Sunjata becomes the guy who is the foundational Mansa, if you will, right? But he is not the one who he's the one who establishes, but he's not the one who takes it to its heyday. That honor, or let's talk about how this was organized, for example. So the people of ancient Mali very much believed in they were a very strong agricultural society. And so they they they, they their religion, pre-Islamic religion, was um uh, was very much tied to what they call the spirits of the land. And the Mansa, which meant the ruler, the chief was typically typically the, the 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 best farmer right because that's the one who's been chosen by the spirits of the land you know but these are just chiefs not like emperors or something then once Sunjata overthrew Sumang, uh, fought Sumanguru and defeated him and he becomes this legendary figure he rises to become uh the one Mansa and Mansa just meant paramount chief right emperor sort of thing and he conquered, aligned with everyone else, you know, conquered some, then other people just persuaded to align, to submit to him, and thus became the first Mansa. And um, so, then going forward, um, the, the 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 emperors that came in, the Malian leaders that came in after Sunjata converted to Islam. That's why you get names like uh, 
Musa, right, which is a, a biblical, uh, a sorry, a name from the an Arabic name for for Moses. Suleiman was Arabic for for Solomon, and um, indeed, and but but in many ways, even though this was a far more fertile and bigger place than Ghana, which is why it thrived, not as long as ancient Ghana, but really the heights it hits, it hits are higher, right. They had a standing army. It was a strong agricultural economy. Taxes on imports and, and exports. Then they also used gold, dust, and salt as currency, much in the same way as ancient Ghana. However, cowrie shells are also introduced to the kingdom as currency beginning in the 14th century. Indeed. Right? Because, uh, you know, as, as the trade gets more and more nuanced, Cowrie shells are introduced as well in the 1300s. So the Manta was never a divine king in the form of Egypt. Remember, the pharaohs were almost like gods. You know, the 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 Manta was never more than a man, a mighty man, but no more than a man. And what do we have in the picture here? We have the mosque of Jene uh, that was built. Debates have it between 1200 and 1330. I know that's a long time, but people just can't pin down exactly when it was built initially. It's the mosque of Jene. It was destroyed, then this particular version was rebuilt in 1907. But that just sort of speaks to how as Islam took over in, in, in ancient Mali, you know, so we get some very remarkable architecture as well that that uh, that is among the most memorable in 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 in, in Africa. And we'll talk about a few other places just now. So 1220, 1225, the kingdom is established. 1200, Sumauru has, set, has, has established his own state with the Soso. Then Sunjata rises to, to challenge him after his tyranny and defeats him. By 1235, the empire of Mali has been established. But it doesn't really hit the heights of its power until some of its Muslim leaders in the 13th in the 14th century, right? And this is very well documented by that uh, Algerian scholar I spoke about, Ibn Battuta, and its success largely revolves around two important leaders, Mansa Musa, who some of you guys will be familiar with, and his brother, Mansa Suleiman, right? So let's talk a little bit about what makes their reign so exceptional here. Or oh, in this picture that I have here is from the Jinga Rebbe, is one of the four madrasas uh, that constituted the University of Timbuktu, which again was was established in the in the era of these mansas, and this is one of the UNESCO World Heritage sites to this day. But this is Jinga Rebbe, indeed. So these two leaders, right, Muslim leaders, powerful leaders, end up elevating the kingdom of ancient Mali. And in the next slide here, we'll, well, we'll talk a little bit about, about Mansa Musa, then we'll talk about Mansa Suleiman and their reign and why it matters so much. Let's start with Mansa Musa, right? Who among the many things that he is known for is, uh, according to permutations, he is the richest man to have ever lived, even in the in this era of Bezos and 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 Elon and, and and these other folks, Mansa Musa is still the richest man to have ever lived. And one of the things that he's known for is his famous pilgrimage to pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, which was uh, part of his trade here was documented by Ibn. I mean, part of his trip was documented by Ibn Fadil Allah Al Omari, right? And let's see here what he what he says a little bit about uh, about the about the about the those travels. Indeed, uh, he Allah Al Omari, um, again for originally from Damascus, uh, modern day Syria, was in Cairo just twelve years after after Mansa Musa made his famous pilgrimage to Mecca, which we'll get into here. And I quote from Al Omari, during my first journey to Cairo and surgeon there, I heard talk of the arrival of the Sultan Musa, or Mansa Musa, Emperor of Mali. And I found the people of Cairo very glad to talk of the large expenditures of those people. I spoke, I questioned the Emir Abu Abbas 
L. Memenda, who spoke of the Sultan's noble appearance, dignity, and trustworthiness. And he quotes uh, the Emir. When I went out to greet him in the name of the glorious Sultan El Malik or En Nasser, who was the Sultan of Egypt, he told me, he gave me the warmest of welcomes and trade, treated me with the most careful politeness. But he would talk to me only through his interpreter, I mean, a spokesperson, right? Although he could speak perfect Arabic. He carried his imperious treasure in many places of gold, worked or otherwise, right? Then the, the rest of this talks about him convincing the 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 Mansa to go meet with the with the Sultan of Egypt, but he had initially refused, saying, I came for the pilgrimage and for nothing else. I do not want to mix up my pilgrimage with anything else. However, the Emir suspected that this guy did just didn't want to bow down to the to the Sultan or kiss the ground before the Sultan. But anyway, he ended up convincing him. Uh, and as saying, like, I will prostrate myself before Allah who created me and brought me into the world, but I won't prostrate myself for a man. So anyway, so they ended up doing that. When the pilgrimage arrived, the Sultan of Egypt sent Mansa Musa a large quantity of drachmas, baggage camels, and choice riding camels with saddles and harness. Uh, the Sultan of Egypt caused abundant quantities of foodstuffs to be brought for his suite and his followers, established posting position stations for the feeding of the animals and gave the emirs the pilgrimage of, of the pilgrimage a written order to look after and respect Mansa Musa. When the latter returned, it was I who went to greet him and settle him into his quarters. So listen to this though. This part is fascinating. This man, the Mansa, spread upon Cairo the flood of his generosity. There was no person, officer of the court, or holder of any office in Cairo who did not receive a sum in gold from him. The people of Cairo earned incalculable sums from him, whether by buying or selling or by gifts. So much gold was current in the Cairo that it ruined the value of money. Let me add that gold in Egypt had enjoyed a high rate of exchange up to the moment of their arrival. The gold midkar that year had not fallen before 25 drachmas. So that's just the exchange rate just talking about. But from that day of the arrival onward, it's not recovered. The exchange rate was ruined, and even now it has not recovered. The midkar scarcely touches 22 drachmas. That is how it has been for 12 years from that time because of the great amounts of gold they brought to Egypt and spent there. What am I talking about here? Mansa Musa, the Muslim that he is, and as Muslims are required, went on the Hajj, the trip to Mecca, right? I'm, I've am i ended quoting now. I'm just, I'm explaining this. So he got several camels, several servants, and went from Mali to Mecca, stopping by Egypt, where these encounters that the book describes happen, where he ends up giving out so much gold, so much gold, to, to the common man, to people who work there, such that by the time he left and when Al Omari comes to visit Egypt, 12 years after this trip happened, the economy is still suffering because he flooded the market with gold. That's a concept. That's inflation, right? That's what, that's what he's describing here. So, for example, I was talking about the Fed earlier and how they control the money. So if all of a sudden the Fed says puts, I don't know, says puts a billion dollars into the into the fiscus, into every year, into the people every year, they're doing that with an understanding that this is the money that will keep us solvent. If all of a sudden somebody comes from elsewhere and puts an extra $5 billion into the economy, the value of things would plummet, right? The value of money would plummet. That's what happens with Mansa Musa giving all this gold to the masses. Right. So incredible wealth. Another thing that the Mansa is also known for is his commitment to 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 intellectual development, because when he went to Mecca and when he came back, he brought back scholar, Berber scholars, scholars from from Egypt and so forth to help him develop the University of Timbuktu and other such things. Right. So in, in, in some ways, he, and he also sent some of his scholars to universities like uh, universities like Al Karawin in Fez, Morocco, 
to get educated so that they could bring back the skill. So in a way, he's the pioneer of like this uh, study abroad program, isn't he? <laughs> and what do we have in this graphic over here? Well, to talk about putting the country on the map. This is one of the most important map, uh, uh, maps from medieval Europe. I think it's a Catalonian map. Okay. And they would use like different uh, figures to depict different things of importance. So when you look here, you see, this is actually maybe like a hundred years after Mansa Musa had reigned, but you see there's an image of him holding a golden egg to situate where ancient Mali is, right? Where Mali is, because he had become the perfect representation of what Mali was. So he literally put his country on the map and the fact that people in as far out as Catalonia, Spain, and in, in medieval Europe, when they were using maps for their own purposes, they were still using him as the symbol of this sort of speaks to his uh, to his uh, to his grandeur indeed indeed another thing that's worth talking about i want to talk a little bit about this here because some of you guys may have heard of the of the book called they came before columbus which uh, is a disputed book but it makes the case that there was an African presence way before Columbus, right? And they use you know archaeological evidence of things that uh, resemble West African artifacts that were found in the Americas um, in the period before before the Europeans settled here. But part of the part of that idea is also rooted in a story that Mansa Musa told Al Omari, right? And let me see if I can find it here, because I think it's it's very fascinating. Uh, yeah, this from a section called uh, Ocean Travels in this book. No, this is our Omari documenting this uh, conversation between uh, Mansa Musa and Amir Abu Hassan, Amir Hajib. So Omari writes, the Emir told me that he was often in the company of Mansa Musa when he came to Egypt on that pilgrimage, right? A friendship grew up between them and the Sultan Musa, the Mansa Musa told him a great deal about himself and his country and the people of the Sudan who were his neighbors. The Sudan just means uh, not modern day country of Sudan, even though that's where the name comes from, but it just means uh, other black Africans, right? Who were neighbors to, who were not Berbers or North Africans who were neighbors to, to Mansa Musa. The Amir continued, I asked Sultan Musa how the kingdom fell to him. And he said, we belong to a house which hands on the kingship by inheritance. The king who was my predecessor did not believe that it was impossible to discover the furthest limit of the Atlantic Ocean and wished vehemently to, to do so. So he equipped 200 ships filled with men and the same number filled with gold water and provisions enough to last them for years. And he said to the man deputed to lead them, do not return until you reach the end of it or your provisions and water give out. They departed and a long time passed before anyone came back. Then one ship returned and we asked the captain what news they brought. And he said, yes, O Sultan, we traveled for a long time until there appeared in the open sea, a river with a powerful current. Mine was the last of those ships. The other ships went on ahead, but when they reached that place, they did not return, and no more was seen of them, and we do not know what became of them. As for me, I went about at once and did not enter the river. But the sultan disbelieved him. Then the sultan got ready 2,000 ships, 1,000 for himself and the men who, whom he took with him, and 1,000 for water and provisions. He left, he left me to deputize for him and embarked on the Atlantic Ocean with his men. That was the last we saw of him and all those who were with him. So I became king in my own right. So what a crazy story of how he came into power, right? But it also leads us to believe that between the 200 ships that went the first time and only one came back, and indeed, if these 2,000 ships went on, is there a chance that some of these groups made it to the US, to to the Americas at least, 
that's I'll, I'll let you guys do that study for yourselves you know let me know what you find out in the comments or what you know about this but anyway the book by i think it's ivan van Setem, i believe um called uh they came before columbus makes these claims that there was some of these people who made it from west africa but in any case this is not that topic we can engage that a little more but yeah mansa musa it's it's at his peak after him mansa suleiman takes over he's not as exorbitant as his brother in fact he's actually described by i think by ibn battuta as being more a miserly king but he's a good king he's just not as as, as vibrant but after after him let's see if we can find a description of 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 uh of of my man oh yeah this is ibn battuta writing that was our omari writing about mansa musa this is ibn battuta writing about mansa suleiman he is a miserly king not a man from whom one might hope for a rich present so he's a little more stingy he's not as generous as his brother it happened that i spent these two months without seeing him on account of my illness Later on, he held a banquet in commemoration of our master, Abu Hassan, to which the commanders, doctors, Qadi, and preachers were invited, and I went along with them. Reading desks were brought in, and the Quran was read through, and they prayed for our master, Abu Hassan, and also for Mansa Suleiman. When the ceremony was over, I went forward and saluted him. The Qadi, the preacher, and Ibn Fakir told him who I was, and he answered to them in their tongue. They say to me, the Sultan says to you, give thanks to God. So I said, praise to God and thanks under all circumstances. So I don't know, end quote. So I don't know, the, the Mansa Suleiman, he doesn't sound bad. He's just a different personality. We can't know, ain't enough, ain't enough cloth for all of us to be cut from it, right? But he kept the kingdom going. But eventually, weak ruler succeeded Mansa Suleiman and, and, and Mansa Musa and outer provinces started to break away. Then also they were started to be attacked. There was a group known as the Mossi who raided them from the south. And also when, when the empire had expanded, right, uh, it had incorporated Timbuktu, which is like the jewel city in this region. But there were Berbers who were also invested in it and they had lived there before. So they recaptured Timbuktu in 1433. And that recap of Timbuktu pretty much spelled the end of Mali in its heyday. And, but one of the fascinating things about, about ancient Mali is, is, uh, is the University of Timbuktu, as well as the Library of Timbuktu, which at its peak, this is where this image is taken from, held between 400,000 and 700,000 manuscripts. Okay. And listen to, to some modern re, uh, 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 relevance to this, so modern connection. In April 2012, Timbuktu was captured by Tuareg rebels in collaboration with Al-Qaeda forces and declared the town part of the independent country of Azawad. They outlawed music, football, and destroyed a number of shrines dedicated to Sufi saints. They also began destroying ancient books on January 25, 2013, the rebels entered one of Timbuktu's libraries, swept manuscripts off the shelves, poured gasoline on them, and set them alight. By then, however, the vast majority of the books had already been saved thanks to the heroic efforts of a few librarians who had smuggled hundreds of thousands of books out of the town. And eventually, so end quote, so eventually the... 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 Uh, the rebels were were, were 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 conquered, and Timbuktu was reincorporated into Mali. And there's been a huge project to rebuild the library, which is now open to the public. I believe the last time I checked. But isn't it interesting that the Tuareg Berbers recaptured Timbuktu in 1433, and recaptured Timbuktu again in 2012? Like this beef is one for the ages hundreds and hundreds of years apart. But in any case, after, even though the Tuareg Berbers did not hold on to, to Timbuktu, which we'll see shortly here, 
uh, ancient Mali was pretty much done by the 1500s, right? So it had a good run from say 1200, 1225, we can say it started, had a very good uh, three, almost like 300 year run, okay? But in its place would rise another empire, the last of what we can say were the huge empires, um, ancient empires, if you will, if you want to describe it as that. Now, here I want to emphasize that these groups did not just exist in a vacuum, right? Um, or they, that there was no overlap, because you will see this overlap. And the Songhai state is a great example of this, because even before the Mali Empire, in fact, even before the demise of ancient Ghana was afoot, the Songhai state already existed. This goes back to the 800s, okay? So it is generally established within this area here, a little bit, a little bit to the to the east of where Ghana would be. And this map here is for scale. It shows that Ghana was big, but it was like this big. Then Mali came out and was even bigger than Songhai came out and was especially much bigger than both. Even though Ghana lasted the longest, followed by Mali, then the Songhai Empire the the burnt the brightest but uh existed the shortest so again the songhai state um occupied by hunters and farmers was uh and mainly like soninka people was established by the ninth century right and they grew slowly uh, they would trade with the with the gao settlement which was a berber settlement um uh Tarker, these are the places we mentioned earlier. That's what they would trade with, right? And they're sort of just doing their own thing on the side. Then ancient Mali comes, rises to prominence, they're still sort of trading with them. But then the decline of ancient Mali ends up being the catalyst, right? They see that gap. And in 1468. Okay, so they've had other leaders before, but a leader named Sonny Ali comes up and becomes this phenomenal, fierce leader, one of the most important leaders of, if you want to call it medieval Africa, at least of these communities, right? He's a, he's a warrior. He's a, he's a military leader uh, par excellence. And he has this strong army with horsemen and canoes. Remember, horses aren't commonplace in this play in, in, in West Africa at this point, but he's it's got horsemen, he's got canoes. He's also Muslim, so he pivots his Muslim faith to reestablish trade with different groups. But in 1468, um, just a mere, what is that, 35 years since the Tuareg Berbers had recaptured Timbuktu from Mali, Sony Ali captures it, right? And he is a force. But here, here's the thing. He is very polarizing in history because when the Muslims write about him, they write about him as if he was a brute, he was uncultured, he is a barbarian, right? But in oral tradition from the Songhai Empire, he's spoken about as this hero, right? And uh, he's, again, the, 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 the military man par excellence and leader who really... Um, brought the Songhai Empire, which is what it was at the time, into, into prominence. So why is there this disconnect? Well, part of it was, even though, as his name suggests, he was Muslim, he was also very much into more indigenous practices that when uh, Arab scholars who had come from, who were strict Muslims, who had come from Egypt or, 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 or places like that, when they would come and they would write about him, they would be very disappointed by some of the things that they see him do, right? Because they're like, that's not Islam. The, so even his violence, and sometimes he would attack groups that were also claiming to be Muslim, which again is is haram. You know, you can't do that, you know? So that painted them in a, in a different light to... So, but think about that. That that discourse is not, is not new, right? The fact that somebody would look like a hero... In fact, Tanahisi quotes in his book uh, "Between the World and Me," I think he writes, "How come he's talking about uh, about white America? I believe, and he talks about how come only the or the Western world, how come only their heroes are allowed to be violent, right? 
Think about that because if you think about George Washington, he's a he's a he's a he's a, he's a general, he's a military general. So to whoever was not of the cause that he was fighting for, it might be like an invading brute, right? They might describe him that way. But of course, in 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 uh, to to the U.S., he is the is the founding father and national hero to this day, right? Uh, Nelson Mandela, for a long time, was on the terrorist watch list, right? A lot of people who he was fighting against thought of him as a terrorist, right? He's among the in South Africa and the Pan African community and other anti-apartheid groups. He's a uh, He's a pillar of inspiration and one of the greatest people to have ever lived, right? So these disconnects exist uh, depending on perspective. But that's, in fact, um, uh, the people at Home Team History, which if you've been watching this channel, you know, it's one of my favorite uh, channels, did a great video about the legacy of Sonny Ali and why it's polarizing like that. And I'll make sure to put it in the description box as well. Indeed. Uh, but after him, he's replaced... The, the Sony dynasty, after Sony Ali's son, Sony Baru takes over, then he is eventually deposed by one of uh, Sony Ali's generals known as Mohamed Toure, right, was of Soninke origin himself. And this guy was a far more devout Muslim. He went to Mecca. Uh, he, you know, he even met with the sheriff of Mecca and was named by the sheriff of Mecca, which is it's a, the equivalent of... of Maybe not the equivalent, but as close to the Pope as you can get within this space, right? As the Caliph of the Sudan, which means he, he was the Muslim authority in, 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 in Black Africa, if you will. And he founded his own dynasty to succeed the Sunni dynasty, known as the Askia dynasty. And in many ways, because he wasn't necessarily just interested in fighting against uh, the neighbors, he was able to revive the trans-Saharan gold trade, which had taken a hit under the Sunni Ali years. And so from the early 50, from the mid, uh, from around 1450 going forward up until 1591, a, the Songhai Empire would reign, right? Would reign and uh, it had a very good run. And uh, let's see here how the, I want to see how the, 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 the empire is described under the leadership of of the of 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 Mohammed Toure, right? And I quote here. This is from an Italian under the name Leo Africanus, right? Who was writing um, after visiting this Timbuktu under the Mus uh, Askia dynasty? It says, "Here are many shops of craftsmen and merchants." especially those who weave linen and cotton cloth. To this place, Berber merchants bring cloth from Europe, right? All the women in this region except maid servants go with their faces covered and sell all necessary kinds of food, right? They are, they are Muslim. The inhabitants are exceedingly rich, so much so that the present king has married both his daughters to two rich merchants. There are many wells here containing very sweet water, and when the river Niger floods, they convey its water by channels to the town. The region produces corn, cattle, milk, and butter in great, ab in great abundance, but salt is very scarce for it's brought here from the land of Tagaza, right to the north, 500 miles to the north, which again is at the, at the heart of that trade we were talking about earlier. When I myself was here, I saw one camel's load of salt for eight, I sold I saw one camel's load of salt sold for 80 ducats. The rich king of Timbuktu, or governor of Timbuktu is what he means to say, has many articles of gold, and he keeps a magnificent and well-furnished court. When he travels anywhere, he rides upon a camel, which is led by some of his noblemen. He travels likewise when he goes to war, and all his soldiers ride upon horses. Attending him, he has always 3,000 horsemen, and a great number of footmen armed with poisoned arrows. They often have skirmishes with those that refuse to pay tribute, and as many as they take to the uh, as they take they sell to the merchants of Timbuktu. 
So it's talking about selling people who they capture in war into into enslavement. Uh, here there are many doctors, judges, priests, and other learned men that are well maintained at the king's cost. Various manuscripts and written books are brought here out of the out of Barbary, which is out of, from among the Berbers, and sold for more money than any other merchandise. The coin of Timbuktu is gold without any stamp or superscription, but in matters of small values, they use cowrie shells brought here from Persia, 400 of which are worth a ducat and six pieces of their own gold, each of which weighs two-thirds of an ounce. Incredible here. Um, eventually, eventually, um, the kingdom of the Songhai Empire ends up succumbing to being invaded by Al Mansur of Morocco in 1591 in an episode that I've described from the Moroccan side in a previous video. But in 1591, the um the 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 Askia dynasty of the Songhai Empire comes to an end when it's invaded by the Moroccans who are able to conquer them. But uh, they don't really conquer them in a way that, that they, they, in fact, after Al Mansur dies, the vigor for, for Moroccan empire fades away and they end up leaving. But the Songhai empire is never quite what it was before, even after the people had left. And a lot of the, 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 the Moroccan generals who were there ended up intermarrying uh, with, uh, with, with women of the Songhai Empire sort of just became a ruling elite within that community. But by 1591, essentially the era, by the 1600s, the era of the great West African ancient empires was done, right? So we've spoken about ancient Ghana, then we spoke about Morocco, then we spoke about, uh, I mean, then we spoke about Mali, then we spoke about the Songhai Empire. So these are our key takeaways. If you want to just, Think about this. Uh, what constituted the, the trans-Saharan trade? What goods were traded? What animals made a difference and what time it was? Who were the original people of Ghana? Right, We spoke about the Soninke people. What factors led to the decline of ancient Ghana? Who established the Malian Empire? And you can think about that epic of Sunjata, right, in the battle with Sumanguru. Uh, what were the emperors called in Mali? That's the name that, you know, so Mansa Musa, Mansa is not his first name. It's, it's his title, which is why when we were reading what Al Omari said, a lot of time he calls him Sultan Musa, right? Who were the, then also remember the brothers. Um, we didn't talk about this section here about the universities. I'll do that in a, in a, in a later video. Uh, what empire succeeded Mali in West Africa? Who was the founding emperor, if you will? It was a state already for hundreds of years before him, but one guy is attributed with founding the state. Why were Arab scholars not as flattering in their descriptions of him compared to local oral tradition? And who succeeded him, right, as an emperor of this empire? And then, of course, you can talk about what led to its ultimate downfall. Indeed. So I hope from this video, you know, we can learn a few things. One, that African empires go on way into history. We've already seen the North African empires in uh, in Egypt, right? We've seen the 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 Phoenicians in 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 what is modern day Tunisia or Carthage. We've seen that. We've also seen Axum in modern day Ethiopia. We've seen Meroe in modern day uh, Sudan. But we haven't really spoken about West Africa in that way. So we can see right away that. These these kingdoms were very nuanced, even by by foreign descriptions, by descriptions of outsiders and visitors, were very glowing. Right? We can also see how interconnected, not just the African communities were, as we can see with them fighting and trading with the Berbers and 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 so forth, and traveling to Mecca and meeting with the Sultan of Egypt and all these things. But you know, we can even talk about the the last part about uh, the song I was talking about using shells that were brought over from Persia. So it's a whole complex inter-system, right? 
But the impo most important thing here is some scholars would like to talk about there really isn't much African history to study. It's fascinating, 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 fascinating work. And this video just goes on to show it. I know you've already been here for a long time. Uh, so I will end here and I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much for listening. Indeed.